very pleased to welcome all of you to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, more commonly known as Chatham House. I, I know for a number of you, this is your first time to Chatham House, so you are very welcome. Chatham House is an independent policy uh, think tank, as it's called. Uh, it's been in existence, it's almost coming up to 100 years. Uh, we're already planning for our centenary. We were created in 1920. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization, as it would be called in the United States, or a charity. Uh, and by royal charter, the Institute isn't allowed to have an opinion. Her Majesty the Queen, in her charter, precludes this Institute from having an opinion. So um, you will never ha hear a Chatham House opinion. You will hear the opinion of the individuals that are at Chatham House. So if I say something, it's my opinion, it's not the Institute. The most famous thing uh, from the Institute, I think, is something called the Chatham House Rule. Uh, if you came in this morning, you'll see the Chatham House Rule on the, on the front desk. It's, it's there emblazoned. Uh, the good news for all of you today is that this meeting has nothing to do with the Chatham House Rule because it's fully on the record. Chatham House Rule uh, requires that you can report what's said, but you can't credit who, who, who said it and is used regularly in diplomacy. Well, today is important for us here at Chatham House because we are um, working on African sovereign wealth funds. And so I'm delighted to be uh, making opening remarks about this conference, Africa's Sovereign Wealth Funds Demand Development and Delivery. The conference couldn't have happened without the support of a number of people. So I'd particularly like to thank Quantum Global for their support of this conference and Jean-Claude Bastos de Moraes, their chief executive officer, for, uh, who is here today in the front row, for, for supporting us. This is uh, an area of research that we want to um, deepen at the Institute. And so we're very grateful uh, to Quantum Global for, for assisting us in, 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 that, in that process. And I'm sure today will be a highly successful event. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge, um, well, all the panelists that are speaking uh, over, over today, and particularly José Filomeno de Souza de Sancho, the chairman of the board of directors of the Fundo Soberano de Angola. Uh, he's just come in specially for this meeting, and we're very, very grateful. But also um, uh, the ministers, Honorable Mona uh, Helen Quarty, the Deputy Minister of Finance for the Republic of Ghana. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for coming. Ghana has a very busy day today with a Eurobond uh, 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 launch here in, uh, in London, and the Minister has found time to, to attend this conference. So we are extremely grateful, and good luck with the Eurobond. Uh, and we do have the um, uh, Minister of Budget of Senegal coming. Uh, he is, I think, hasn't arrived yet um, from Dakar, but I'm very grateful also. He's just come for the day to attend this conference. So I've already outlined um, why uh, we're doing this conference, which is to develop the understanding of the challenges of sovereign wealth funds and develop recommendations relating to both technical as well as political factors. This conference has been designed to be inclusive, so there's a mixture of people from industry, uh, from academia, from civil society, press. Um, it, is what it, it is not a fee-paying conference. It's designed as such uh, to be inclusive. Uh, that also ties into the charitable mandate of this institute. We have to show strong educational value. And so we're very proud of the fact that we have been able to enable uh, as many people who are interested in the subject to attend. Um, it's important, I think, to kind of map where African sovereign wealth funds are going. Since the establishment of the Pula Fund in the mid-1990s, there's been a uh, proliferation of sovereign wealth funds on the African continent. And uh, I'm hoping myself today to hear about the variability also, which work, which don't work so much, where's the learning from elsewhere, those sorts of issues. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this conference has been uh, so much in demand is exactly um, uh, people trying to work out what is the trajectory of sovereign wealth funds in Africa? Where is the best practice? What can we learn? I'm hoping, and this is my final remark before moving to the keynote address, uh, that this conference won't be a flash in the pan, a one-off for, for us here at Chatham House. We will um, produce a report based on this, this conference, and we'll be thinking about 
what is it that a policy institute like ourselves can do uh, following up on this conference? Uh, you will all obviously receive the, 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 the report of the conference. Um, there will be a summary online, and the first session, the keynote uh, address, will be live streamed also. So thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm now delighted to invite José Filomeno de Souza de Santos, the chairman of the board of directors of the Fundo Sobrano de Angola, uh, to provide a keynote address to open our conference. He is going to talk about what sovereign wealth funds can deliver for Africa. Uh, José, thank you for coming, and over to you. Thank you, thank you uh, very much uh, for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, and uh, to be able to share some issues which are very close to our hearts uh, as Africans and as, uh, as managers uh, of, uh, of state assets uh, in the continent. Um, uh, a growing number of, uh, of um, state reserves, cash reserves uh, across several countries and several continents are being managed by sovereign wealth funds from the US uh, to, uh, to China, even to Iran, uh, Korea, several countries in Africa. Uh, increasing amounts are managed by sovereign wealth funds. Uh, this is perhaps why they are becoming uh, so interesting for people, that they are uh, arising uh, so much uh, curiosity. Uh, the sizes of sovereign wealth funds obviously vary. We have uh, Norway's sovereign wealth fund, which has assets up to 878 billion uh, on the one hand, and we have sovereign wealth funds such as Ghana's that has assets of uh, 70 million. Uh, the size uh, is, is irrelevant. What, what is truly relevant is the purpose of this institution, institutions and the work that they can do for their, for, for, for their countries. Uh, worldwide, it's estimated that around uh, 6.7 trillion uh, worth of US dollars is managed by sovereign wealth funds. Uh, more than half of this amount derives from oil and gas, uh, which uh, you know, s says something interesting about this, uh, this industry that generates uh, so, so many revenues and yet uh, 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 th there are other institutions needed to, uh, to make uh, uh, complementary use of, uh, of the uh, uh, revenues that it generates. Uh, another interesting observation is that uh, very few uh, European countries have sovereign wealth funds, uh, except for France, Italy, and uh, Ireland, uh, I believe, uh, no other uh, EU member country has sovereign wealth funds. Uh, that's perhaps something that we could address later or, or, or another forum. Um, because we believe that the uh, primary goal of these institutions, uh, regardless of their distinctive policies, is to preserve the nation's wealth and ensure that this wealth is used for the benefit of, uh, of, uh, of coming generations. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the main thought in mind regarding this is that uh, typically cash left sitting at banks tends to be corroded by, by inflation or in some cases uh, by uh, uh, investment advisors uh, taken over by the whims or the speculative whims of the market as it happened uh, after the uh, 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, no. Given that, uh, those observations, uh, we, we would conclude that the best way to preserve wealth uh, is actually to invest it, but to invest it wisely, because uh, anyone can invest wealth and lose it. So we believe that the wealth should be invested in a way that benefits the country that it's uh, originating from. Uh, we've spent a, a, great deal of, a great deal of time in uh, uh, 2013 focusing on the policy of Angola's sovereign wealth fund and on how it would operate internally on its governance standards and reporting standards 
and the relationship between the funds and the, 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 the other uh, institutions of, uh, of, of government. And uh, what we came up with was, uh, was a clear policy that was ratified by the government that determined how these assets should be invested and determined that they should be invested for the benefit of, of the people and how this money could, uh, could uh, you know, end up benefiting the, the Angolan citizens. Uh, this investment policy document uh, is, a, is a, a, a public document. It uh, represents not only the nature of the fund, but the reason why it exists and also how it plans to, uh, to invest in the future. So we believe that it's a, it's a very important uh, document to have for us as managers of state assets because that's our, our mandate and also for the general public because it, uh, it uh, determines what we are as an institution and what we aim, we, 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 we aim to do in, in the coming years and you know, even beyond that, hopefully. Um, obviously, the case of Angola and even the case of, uh, of, of, of Africa will differ from the case of Norway that has the world's uh, largest sovereign wealth fund. Uh, in the case of uh, Norway, we, we have a, a society which is uh, quite established, quite seasoned. We have uh, impeccable public uh, infrastructure, high levels of income, and as I was just told, a very low level of uh, unemployment, which is very good. Uh, the context in Africa, as uh, many of you will agree, it's, uh, it's much different. Uh, the needs are much greater and much more immediate, uh, which uh, impacts on how the sovereign wealth funds are set up in the continent and also on their prospects uh, for, for the future. Uh, for instance, uh, for, the Norwegian, for the Norwegian population might not even be aware during their daily lives uh, of any investment being done by, uh, by their sovereign wealth funds because the society and the economy itself does not uh, need or is not, uh, is, not, is, not, is, is not in a situation where it should be impacted by this amount uh, and type of investment. In Africa, the situation is very much different. There are uh, social needs, there are investment needs at, uh, at various le levels, but uh, more importantly, uh, the insufficiency uh, in the continent uh, overall, uh, except perhaps for a few economies uh, of which I would highlight uh, South Africa, the main insufficiency is uh, in individual and institutional capacity. Uh, the problems are the ones that we, we know, it's, uh, difficulty in the access to, to health care, to clean water, to power supply, sometimes to education. Uh, and this is a, a context that is not in place because of the lack of willingness of the governments of the continent to provide for its citizens or for its nations. But it's, it's because there is a, a clear uh, lack of institutional capacity and uh, a, a, clearly, a clear demand for additional assistance in investing uh, in these sectors. Uh, we at the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Angola believe that the best way to address this issue is through education and through vocational training. Uh, recently, uh, we have launched a scholarship program for 45 graduates of uh, business to attend a special program in the uh, uh, Swiss University of Applied Sciences. This program will be focusing on asset management and finance, which are areas that not only will benefit the fund in the future, these are our graduates, these are professionals that we will be looking to hire to work for us, but also professionals that might go to the market in the rest of the country to support the financial sector and to support other sectors that need efficient management. So this type of expertise in, in our perspective is key for the country to develop and for the region as well. In addition to that, we are setting up 
a, a hospitality school, uh, also in Angola, you know, open to uh, uh, all of the uh, regional nations, which is aimed at uh, supporting the services sector in the country, as well as the hotel industry, which we believe is the, the doorway for additional investment into the country. Uh, as obviously as a foreign investor, when one lands in a country, one tends to stay at a, at a hotel, and the hotel tends to be the basis for the start of several business. Uh, in Africa, the number of international standard hotel rooms is still relatively low. It's an area where we see a lot of potential for investment, but in order for this investment to reach its potential, in order that the African countries don't have to import both the labor as well as, as, as all of the, uh, the supplies that these types of businesses need, we need to develop internal capacity to first generate this service to be able to manage these businesses and eventually to develop the supply chains that will cater for the, uh, for the, uh, for the output of this industry. So that's also an area that, uh, that uh, we are focusing. Uh, the, the, the key thing to notice here is that uh, our approach to investment, uh, being from a region of the world that has uh, very diverse needs from the developed world, is not just on financial returns, but it's also on social returns. Uh, we see uh, social returns important and even in some cases humanitarian uh, assistance or support important because these are the, uh, the, the efforts that tackle issues such as uh, high child mortality. Angola, for instance, is a country that has uh, 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 one of the largest uh, GDPs uh, in Africa. It has uh, significant uh, uh, financial reserves. Uh, its rating has been upgraded recently by Moody's, but still has the second highest child mortality in the country. It still lacks uh, doctors, it still lacks hospitals. These are things that take time to build. Investment has to be done so that there is a generation in the future that the sovereign wealth fund of the country will be serving. So our, our approach to long-term investments is not purely financial, is not purely looking at the numbers, but it's looking at how the future gener generations will be able to take advantage of the work that we do today and also to help them, to carry them to this, uh, to this uh, development that we are, we are aiming at. Uh, further to child mortality, uh, we, 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 we can talk about uh, uh, increases in employability which allow people not only to provide for themselves but to provide uh, for, for their family and in turn to provide for the uh, for the whole economy. Um, what else did I want to say? I think I've said it. I've said most of it. Um, uh, Seven point five percent of the uh, of the uh, uh, endowments of the fund, or up to that percentage, can be allocated uh, to uh, to the social sector. So this is how much commitment uh, we believe is necessary uh, for uh, for not only uh, financial related issues or, or commercial, commercially related issues, but to, uh, to uh, helping the people of Angola to take the most advantage of, uh, of whatever invested, in investments might come. Uh, as many of you know, Africa has been quite successful as, at attracting foreign direct investment. It has uh, one of the highest rates of growth in terms of foreign direct uh, investments. But uh, uh, most of the, uh, most of the uh, participants in, in, this, uh, in this event from Africa and even, even the other participants will, will agree that uh, it's not fair to watch the country's wealth and resources uh, fly out of the country while most of its nations remain stagnant in terms of development. So something has to be done to that end. That is a task that is normally attributed to the governments and to the state, but in a context where states have uh, deficiencies in terms of institutional capacity, all actors that, uh, that are under its umbrella are required to act. And this is a compliment 
that uh, we believe sovereign wealth funds in Africa should seriously consider in order to be able to deliver not only in financial terms but also to their, to their uh, populations which at the end of the day are the true owners of the assets that they manage. Um, looking even, even further at the concept of sovereign wealth funds uh, themselves, uh, if, if we consider that 49% uh, uh, of the, the assets managed by sovereign wealth funds derive from the oil and gas industry, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting to see that uh, uh, the, the most visible sovereign wealth funds tend not to invest so much in this, uh, in this industry, but to attempt to diversify the sources of, of, of income uh, 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 away from their original uh, in, uh, uh, capital providers. Uh, we believe that this, this tells something very key and something which is, uh, which is uh, very similar across most sovereign wealth funds, uh, which is that they are attempting to support their national economies at becoming more stable, more diversified, and being able to provide for their, uh, for their uh, citizens whatever situation comes in the future. In the case of Africa, we believe that this investment starts with the people by investing in the people and the institutions so that they are prepared for whatever economic context they are faced with uh, in the coming years or the coming decades. Uh, that was my keynote address. I would like to thank you very much for your undivided attention and hope that you have a very interesting day. Thank you.